kind of line up. Because we're digging in the Word. We're purifying ourselves to look like Christ. We're getting rid of this sin. And, and we become a little bit more holy. And, and, and as they line up, we begin to be able to trust our passion a little more. Psalms 37, uh, 4 through 5 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. Have any of you ever heard um, somebody tell you, God will give me the desires of my heart? Well, it comes from this verse, and, and it's, it's kind of true. God will give us the desires of our heart, but there's a catch to it. We have to trust in Him. We have to commit our way to Him, which is kind of what I've been talking about so far today. Digging into the Word, getting rid of that sin, allowing our passion and His desires to really line up. And then, yeah, He's going to give us the desires of our heart, because that's what He wants for us. That's, that's the idea. So, if, if you are in the Word, and you are getting rid of that, some of that sin, you can really begin to trust some of that passion. Putting it in, a, in a practical terms, we, we have youth in here in the, in the church today that love sports, that are really good leaders on the sports teams, and and, and their teammates know that they are Christians, and, and they behave like they should, and they love that. And we have other students in this group that that love farming and, and love 4-H and, and love those things, and they're leaders in the 4-H. And they're passionate about it. Odds are, this seems kind of plain, God probably isn't calling that 4-H leader to be a quarterback if he's not excited about playing quarterback. And that baseball player that just wants to be on a baseball field and represent Christ in that way probably isn't supposed to be a 4-H leader. When we are living for Christ, we can trust that passion. We can trust what we get excited about. But the catch to that is we have to be in the Word first. That's how these, these um, concepts, how God speaks to us, they, they interrelate. We can't just trust whatever we get excited about, whatever our passion is, if we're not living for God. But as we do that, as, as our passion, our desires begin to line up a little bit more, we can see that God speaks to us not just through His Word, but through our passion. The third way that he speaks to us is he speaks to us through the church. And, and I want to clarify this, because I'm not talking about the churches in West Village Christian Church or uh, any specific congregation. But I, I'm talking about God speaks to us through the church that he established at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was poured onto the apostles, the church that... that teaches and lives and breathes nothing more and nothing less but the gospel of Christ. The church. That church is used by God to speak to us. How do we know that? Well, he told us. In John 16, 7-8, Jesus, in speaking to the disciples, he's literally on his way to get arrested, beaten, and crucified. And he says, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. But when he, and then moving on to 13a. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus is teaching. And he says, you will have a guide. And he will guide you into this truth. He's going to convict you. They, they don't get it yet. But they will. And, and in Acts 2, where Christ, where the Holy Spirit is poured onto the apostles, the time of Pentecost, uh, Peter then preaches. And he preaches the first sermon in the church. And at the end of it, in Acts, in Acts 2.37, the, the Bible says that the people are pierced to the heart. And that's the first time that the prophecy that Jesus has in John, that says, look, this guy is going to come, 
and he's going to convict you and he's going to guide you into truth. We see this prophecy being fulfilled in Acts 2. When these people that are listening to Peter speak are pierced. God uses the Holy Spirit, speaks through Peter to people that don't know Christ. So we have an example of uh, God speaking through somebody to a non-Christian. We also have examples of God speaking through Christians to other Christians. In Acts 1, right before uh, the Holy Spirit comes on, they only have 11 apostles. You see, Judas has uh, kind of snuck out the back door, and now we're down to 11, and they have to figure out who number 12 is going to be. So they cast lots. They don't have the Holy Spirit, and they literally draw for who's going to become the 12th apostle. They just pray, and they, and they let God choose. But just a few chapters later, when the apostles say, hey, look, the, the widows and the orphans aren't getting taken care of, we, we basically we need deacons. They're going, to, or they're going to take care of these people. They allow the leaders in the church, they allow the people that are being used by God to talk. And, and they choose, they elect, they pray, and then they make that decision. These spirit-filled men are used by God to speak. Now, don't get me wrong. We can't use... Whatever somebody says, we, they, you know, if somebody's a Christian, they come up and they, and they say, you know, you need to go do this. You can't just take that and be like, well, Taylor said at church that I'm supposed to listen to whoever's in the church. But if somebody says, look, I think you need to start doing this in your life. Or even more, hey, you're doing something, I think you need to cut it out. God made me speak to that person, especially if what they're saying lines up with God's word. It may be a passion deep down that you know you shouldn't be doing this. God is literally really laying it on your heart and you're feeling guilty about it. Or you're feeling like you should talk to somebody. And all these things are kind of lining up. We can probably take that. In fact, Proverbs tells us it's the fool that rejects wisdom. So lest we be fools, we better at least consider what this Christian is telling us. So we've seen God speaks to us through His Word. When we're in His Word, God speaks to us through our passion. And we get confirmation of all that when God speaks to us through the church. But we really don't have the right to say, I don't hear God. God's not speaking to me. Unless we are in the Word on a regular basis. Not just in it, but, but doing what it says. We're not just looking at a mirror and walking away, but we're doing what the Word says. We're purifying our lives, expecting Christ. Trying to become Christ-like. And, and, and respecting and honoring what, what other Christians are telling us about our lives and how we should be living. And when we take that all in... We're going to hear God. Because it's a promise that He's given us. God spoke us into existence. He speaks to us every single day through His Word and our passion and the church. And God is going to continue to speak, teach, and guide us until that awesome day when Christ returns. It's only through His guidance that we are even remotely capable of making a competent decision. To make, make it a God-fearing decision. So whatever your next step is in life, big or small, stop. And listen to God's voice. So each and every one of us, every day, may commit to becoming more and more like Christ. Chad, would you come up and give the invitation to